JoJo's Bizarre Adventure has been an ongoing series since 1987, and over its 35 years of stories, it's never been afraid to change and evolve over time. This is in part a result of the generational aspect of JoJo, which offers an unprecedented amount of variety from a single series, with new protagonists, settings, time periods, themes, and even genres from its eight current parts. Yet they all still retain an important sense of familiarity, so no matter if we're traveling across the world in 30 days, thrown into a slice of life murder mystery, following the conspiracy of of an Italian mafia or breaking out of a Florida prison, it's never been a question if it's gone too far or isn't JoJo anymore because of the persistent themes and iconography that connect all of these wildly different ideas. We can take a look at any scene from any part and almost immediately know this is JoJo. The first six parts of JoJo tell the story in chronological order, with each part building and expanding the world as well as the Joestar family tree. Although the interconnected element of the story can become a bit confusing to readers in the seventh part, where things go way beyond just a time skip and change in setting. Rather, the series shifts into an entirely different universe and continuity, creating a new timeline and new family tree, starting all the way back from the beginning in 1890, with a reimagining of characters and events from previous parts, such as Jonathan and Joestar, the Zeppeli family, Dio Brando, and many others who we meet throughout the Steel Ball run, also overwriting the story from the original universe, which by all means appeared as a reboot of Jojo, yet at the same time, it's not, as it's considered a continuation of the story, being the seventh part. Which is where I think people get confused by the timeline, and more so, the reasoning behind this change. So why did Araki create an alternate universe, ending the original and foregoing the series 17 years of history, only to start over from the beginning. In this video, I'll be detailing the reasoning and history behind the biggest change in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the resetting of its timeline and departure from Shonen Jump during its seventh part. Spoiler warning for the end of Stone Ocean, as well as visuals of early Steel Ball Run and JoJo Lian. The most obvious reason for the change to an alternate universe can be found at the end of Stone Ocean, where in the original timeline, Enrico Pucci had created the ultimate stand, Made in Heaven, an accelerated time to its singularity point resetting the universe. Although due to Pucci's defeat after this process, the universe would reset once again, but now without the influence of Pucci on the world, rewriting the lives of all of those affected by him, concluding with the main cast having new identities and memories, but ultimately still being the same people we knew throughout the part just with better lives, and not fated to die to Pucci. Although the most important change in this reset universe was Jolene's ability to break out of her fate and having a new name, Irene, and no longer having the curse of a Joestar needing to fight some battle passed down to her by a distant ancestor, and putting an end to the Jojo naming scheme and their burden of hardships and constant fights against evil. So from a writing perspective, this would make sense for Araki to no longer be able to continue the story of Jojo, as it would invalidate the meaning of Stone Ocean's ending, so it would make sense for such a drastic change, and continue telling the story of Jojo, but now in a parallel world. Although interestingly, this was not the reason for Steel Ball Run and the alternate universe. It wasn't the end of Stone Ocean which gave rise to the idea, rather it was the idea and necessity of the alternate universe that resulted in the ending of Stone Ocean. Araki would write an extensive reflection of his feelings at the time during the ending of Stone Ocean, which was published in the Stone Ocean Bunkabon version, released in 2008, while Araki was already well into Steel Ball Run. I will have the full author afterward translation provided in the description if you want to read it in its entirety, but to paraphrase, Araki had felt like he reached his creative limit and that scared him. The moment he started to feel satisfaction from his work, he felt like he had nothing left to create, believing JoJo's Bizarre Adventure had reached its summit and that Stone Ocean was the end. I felt like I had reached the peak of my creativity. As an author, I had drawn everything my capabilities allowed. Finding yourself in a situation where you think everything's going well and you don't need to do anything more is without a doubt a terrible situation as a person and as a mangaka. People act to achieve something, to obtain satisfaction above all else, but what do they do when they reach it? This contradictory feeling crept up my heart while I was coming up with an ending for Stone Ocean. So Araki, ultimately feeling uncomfortable with the accomplishment of Stone Ocean, didn't want this to be the end of his work, and for that reason, he decided on writing a renaissance of Jojo, going back to its origin, leaving modern day, and returning to nature. This was the initial idea for Steel Ball Run. So while the alternate universe timeline can easily be described as a reboot, this was far from Araki's intention. The term reboot often has a negative connotation, as they can be means to erase 
embrace what came before or attempt to fix the original work. This is why successful reboots are always created with a deep appreciation, understanding, and acknowledgement of the original works, retaining the themes and tone. For example, Devilman Crybaby, Doom 2016, and Mad Max Fury Road. Okay, I know those aren't all technically considered reboots, but they're all within the category of revivals, reimaginings, retelling, so just go with it. They're all examples of iconic and influential works from different mediums being reimagined for modern times that retain that same idea of renaissance. This is ultimately the reason why Steel Ball Run is the seventh part and not a separate series, as it's a continuation of the themes of JoJo and a celebration of the series, acknowledging what came before and embracing it, and having the expectation that readers will have the knowledge of the previous parts. And this creative solution of a parallel universe was the way for Araki to continue telling the story of JoJo, but in a new way that freed him from the limitations imposed by the original universe. These limitations, including the time period of modern day, as well as the complexity of stand abilities over time. When Araki says he had reached the peak of his creativity, this is mostly referring to the stands he created. Visualizing time, gravity, and the forces of the world we can't see is where Araki found his satisfaction, and he felt he couldn't go any further with the abilities or continue to outdo himself. Which is definitely a sentiment I can sympathize with as a reader of JoJo, because where the hell are things supposed to go after Bohemian Rhapsody, Underworld, and Made in Heaven? It's clear that drastic changes need to be made, otherwise readers would have expected more out of Araki. Time that got faster, and faster for human senses to perceive, getting closer to the concept of infinity. Given we can't really comprehend much of it, how could there possibly be a stand power bigger than this? There's nothing more incredible. My creativity has reached the highest points, Araki thought to himself. The insane ending of Stone Ocean was created to reinforce this idea and embrace it, that the world of Jojo had reached its highest point, its singularity, both through Araki's creativity as well as within the story, creating Made in Heaven, to give readers the same satisfaction of reaching the summit that Araki had felt. As it was after Araki decided on the idea of renaissance and returning to nature, that he then realized he would need to change Stone Ocean's ending to ensure there was no possible way the story could move forward in that world. Araki had said, I need to strengthen further Father Pucci's stand power. This way time, the characters, the bloodlines, the whole universe will have a turnaround and go back to their origins. For Jojo's bizarre adventure, I had to leave modern days and return to nature. I had to change Stone Ocean's ending right before the last chapters for this reason. I brought out all of the nostalgic feelings I had in my soul, and this is why it came out like that. So while some people may chastise readers and call them illiterate, although sometimes that may be the case, there are certain things about Jojo that can be confusing for readers to fully comprehend as just a casual reader. This is in reference to the common misunderstanding that it was the ending of Stone Ocean and the Universal Reset which created the Steel Ball Run universe. But in the context of the story, the two worlds have no connection to each other whatsoever, and no events in either universe have ever had any influence on the other. They are completely separate. But it's certainly not unreasonable to see why so many people may have thought this. Because of Stone Ocean's ending depicting a universal reset in two different timelines where characters and events had changed, and this was immediately followed by a new universe and timeline in Part 7. So while Made in Heaven and the universe reset was all created and necessary for Araki to write Steel Ball Run, in the context of the story, they're not connected. The reset is more of a metaphor for how Araki was feeling at the time and to lead into the new universe. As Steel Ball Run can best be described as a reset, telling the story over from the beginning, that also resets readers' expectations, deliberately simplifying most of the stands and there being overall less of them, setting a new baseline for the universe's power levels, which also allows Araki to revisit previous ideas and write powers differently that can be seen as parallel versions or twists on previous stands, working within the theme of Renaissance. So the reason why Jojo moved to an alternate universe and reset its timeline is because it was a product of creative problem solving, and the solution Araki found to be able to continue writing the story of Jojo while keeping the feeling of complete satisfaction satisfaction never too close. And while discussing the shift from Stone Ocean to Steel Ball Run, I would also like to address some of the interesting history behind this transition during the time. Like the marketing of Steel Ball Run, dropping the title of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, as well as its shift to Monthly Ultra Jump, where the series remains till this day. For those unaware, when Steel Ball Run first hit Shonen Jump, it was not titled the seventh part, or even JoJo, just Steel Ball Run. And in the author notes of the first chapter, Araki had written, 
Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is entering a parallel world, and by that, I mean it's no longer Jojo, it's Steel Ball Run. Which is admittingly a contradicting statement, referring to the manga as Jojo, but then saying it's no longer Jojo, and I could imagine readers at the time would be pretty confused about where the story's going and how we got here. It wasn't until the first volume release of Steel Ball Run a few months later that Araki would clarify what Steel Ball Run was actually meant to be, writing within the author note, saying, in substance, I drew Steel Ball Run as the seventh part of the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Saga. However, for the readers who might begin with this volume, I prefer to not insist too much on that affiliation. On the other hand, completely burying one's past work in order to create a brand new one is, in my opinion, a bad habit of any manga author. It's important to find a theme which carries on from the past. So Araki was creating Steel Ball Run with the image of a new series in mind, one that can be read by someone who's never even heard of JoJo before. Although the dropping of the series title, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, was actually at request of Araki's editorial department and Shueisha, saying to remove the title of Jojo and draw it as a new work that seems to be connected to the past or not. The reasoning for this was to combat the inevitable drop in readers' motivation following the conclusion of a long serialization, referring to Stone Ocean. But with marketing Steel Ball Run as a brand new series from manga legend Hirohiko Araki, they would be able to garner more excitement and new fans while maintaining longtime readers. And it wasn't necessarily deceptive at the time either, as Araki was creating the beginning of a new story for both audiences new and old. In fact, it was more of a marketing stunt, if anything, making the readers curious about what this series really was. With Shonen Jump billboards asking the question, Steel Ball Run or Jojo at the time of its release, asking readers to find the mystery behind this new title, as well as it fit the theme of a new beginning and welcomed in many new readers who may have not read the series otherwise if it was called Part 7, thinking it was connected to the previous parts. Although eventually in Chapter 20, Four of Steel Ball Run, when the series changed magazines from Weekly Shonen Jump to Monthly Seinen Ultra Jump, we would see the return of the title, being marketed as JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 7, Steel Ball Run. So to first address the change in magazine, this was something Araki and his editors had been considering before Steel Ball Run began. The biggest contributing factors behind this change were Araki eventually becoming exhausted by the weekly release schedule, as well as the aging of the readers. As the series had been serialized for over 16 years at this point, and most fans were well into their 20s and 30s. So in a way, it felt like this series should graduate to a more mature magazine and grow along with the readers. Although for Araki, this didn't mean making his manga more graphic or explicit. In fact, after the change, Araki's editor Ito would remind Araki-sensei that he's no longer writing in a boy's magazine, and that he can draw cruel depictions and sexual expressions. However, Araki decided to continue drawing Jojo on the royal road, a concept he speaks about at length in his book, Manga in Theory and practice, essentially being a path one must follow to create manga, specifically a path of virtue and lawfulness that is reflected in all aspects of the work. Although there are a handful of examples of a Rocky drawing not safe for shonen material and writing characters with moral ambiguity, the manga mostly continues on the royal road. The biggest change that came from Steel Ball Run moving to monthly was a Rocky's ability to draw scenery. This was specifically the reason why he needed to make the change in the middle of the story, as he found it was becoming too difficult difficult to draw the manga correctly, as there just wasn't enough pages in a weekly magazine, as the story featured vast landscapes of the American Southwest and with a majority of the characters riding horses, which just require more space. To quote Araki on the matter, he says the publication of this work switched from weekly shonen jump to monthly ultra jump, not just because after many years the weekly deadlines began to feel stressing, but also because I felt that in Steel Ball Run the area, referring to the number of pages per chapter, which I could draw had grew a lot. I I sensed that I could improve the proportions between backgrounds and characters and also felt that I found an ideal rhythm to develop this manga, which by its nature is more suited to being monthly. And when reading Steel Ball Run, especially with the monthly transition period in mind, it's a night and day difference after chapter 24. He tells the story at relatively the same pace but gives the art so much more room to breathe, having to fit less dialogue within each page and everything just feels less cramped, and bring more attention and detail to the scenery and character expressions often dedicating entire pages to a single character facial expression or just scenery. If not for this change, I don't think Steel Ball Run would be as highly regarded as it is. And it's because of this thoughtful and necessary evolution that Steel Ball Run is often considered Araki's most acclaimed work yet, as it was simply able to do more than the other parts and adapted to Araki's needs as he grew as a creator. So before Steel Ball Run even began, there was a lot of steps Araki took to ensure this manga's success. Not only was this a fresh start, right 
fighting Jojo from the beginning, freed from the limitations and expectations from the original universe, but now he's given more time and room to draw his vision correctly. And this is of course being on top of his decades of experience, really creating the perfect storm for Araki to create a masterpiece. Recounting more of the history behind this transition, it occurred at chapter 24, which in the first publication was called Prologue, acting as a brief introduction to the story and characters for the readers of Ultra Jump, which also referred to Jaro Zeppeli as the main character and focused on his backstory and motivation. This chapter would later be called an interlude in the volume release of Steel Ball Run. It was also at the publication of this chapter that the title, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 7, would first officially be labeled onto the series by request of Araki, saying, I really want to call it Jojo. It's just Jojo, isn't it? Comparing the series to the 007 movie series, even the actors, the stage, and the era change, it's still one series, it's the same. So since at this time, Steel Ball Run had already established characters like Johnny, Dio, and Zeppeli, as well as reintroduced stands back into the story, it seemed Araki figured it was time to just accept it's still Jojo, and consider it as such in a public way. And from that point on, Jojo has continued, and continues still through Part 8 Jojolian, and will continue in the future with the upcoming Part 9, Jojo Lands. And that is the reason and history behind the alternate universe in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. So thank you all so much for watching the video. Please be sure to like it if you learned something new, or if you enjoyed it, or if you just made it this far. And also be sure to subscribe to the channel for more Jojo, manga, and anime content. I've been Exports. Thank you all so much for watching again, and I'm out. Peace.